<laughs> well, thank you, uh, Gunnar and uh, Carl and uh, Lisa, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is an amazing day. Uh, it's amazing in part because I'm here at all, but here at a time when there has been an election in the United States that's had such an extraordinary consequence and unique historical event of a new president who is a black American. Now I raise this as a, the beginning of my talk because it's at the heart of the kind of discoveries that I've been involved in with Carl and with others uh, here at the Bear and at the uh, Stockholm uh, Resilience Center for at least, I think, it must be 20 years. And what I'd like to do in my uh, brief presentation is first of all review some of the work that uh, led to this, these ideas and theories of change that are given the word uh, resilience. I want to show how those ideas and theories have been tested in two different ways, one a, very, a more traditional scientific way and more, one a more subjective way. <coughs> and I want to end <coughs> talking about the transformations in the world now that are taking place and what we might do as partners in those changes. So the work itself started essentially 35 years ago when I was uh, developing one of the early models, computer-based models, simulation models, of predator-prey interactions. That work came out of a, about a five to 10 year program of experimental uh, 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 work on understanding uh, the various kinds of predation that occur in the world, all the way from bacteria to literally people in submarines and what have you. And out of that experimental work that was driven by a desire to have precision and some generality and holism, out of it came a representation of predation that fell into about four principal categories. Each category of predation uh, having different stability properties. So I got to that point uh, and decided then that perhaps we should make a run at it and try developing a population model that would interact simulated predators and simulated prey. And there's Uno Svedin, who's welcome, <laughs> uh, uh, on, a, on an old, uh, what was called an IBM 1130, which was programmed with great stacks of cards and, and took hours to generate what now would be generated in minutes. And I remember vividly the first run of that model, runs of that model. And it actually stunned me because the first runs said there are regions in this interaction between the two populations where it's stable, where the two popula populations interact, ending up at a stable limit cycle or a stable point. But there are other regions, lo and behold, in which one or the other goes extinct. Now that came to me as being stunning because I was affected, as much of our uh, people of my age was, by the paradigm and theoretical foundations of ecology at that time, which was essentially a homeostatic regulation. That is, like uh, uh, homeothermy in a, in an organ in a warm-blooded organism with a temperature being regulated at around a certain uh, temperature. And all the emphasis in my training was dominated by this idea of an equilibrium, equilibrium condition, and events near that equilibrium. But this model was saying, while that is true, there is also something else happening. There's a limited range over which those stabilizing forces operate. 
And in fact, what's as important as the equilibrium and near equilibrium conditions, equally important is the uh, uh, conditions at the edge of that stability domain where the system can flip from being in one state to being in another. Now that came to me, honestly, as just, uh, well, I, it was turning, a, 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 it created for me a new paradigm. And now suddenly, in things like regulation of uh, population numbers in, in harvesting fish or, or forests or, or grasslands, came the realization that variability itself in ecosystems was more important than constancy. That the command and control approach that would manage a population of fish, say, so as to produce a maximum sustained yield, you know, with relatively little uh, fluctuation, could in its success create the conditions for the collapse of the organism being managed. That's what happened in the cod in Newfoundland. The very success of achieving the stabilization of a population near an equilibrium through control of fishing and whatnot means that the natural system and its diversity can begin to evolve. That the diversity that maintains the system in the stability region can begin to shrink. Same is true of salmon on the west coast of, of uh, North America. Uh, salmon populations, natural salmon populations, have been dramatically restricted over the last century. And now it's dependent upon a, smooth, a small number of uh, uh, surviving fisheries, uh, surviving stocks, rather, and as well as enhanced uh, uh, facilities. The shrinkage of that diversity, spatial, ecological, biological, means that the system can begin to get close to the edge of that stability region, unknown to the people who are doing the management. So here was an interesting situation where the success of management could lead to the shrinkage of the domain of stability such that it would cross the populations, causing the collapse. And that, in fact, is what has occurred in a number of resource circumstances. <coughs> so the idea of this uh, multi-stable state began to be dominant. In looking at the causes of it, it began to be apparent that the causes, as revealed by these experimental, experimental work, the causes seemed to me to be literally universal. That every ecosystem would have these properties, which were properties seen when densities of organisms were low, certain nonlinearities would appear that would produce this uh, destabilization. So I got to this point. And for 30 years, it stayed there, really. <laughs> because it was extreme, while it, was, uh, it had been already demonstrated by good scientific foundation, the experimental reality of these nonlinearities, it was another thing to establish the fact that the flips, in fact, do occur in nature and that when they occur, they persist, and returning them back to the original uh, configuration is very difficult. That took about 20, 25 years with work by people like Steve Carpenter in the University of Wisconsin and Martin Schaefer in Europe in the freshwater lakes, uh, shallow lakes, until they were able to demonstrate that, yes, indeed, these instabilities, these flips from one state to another, do occur in these variety of ecological situations. And to return the situation back to the way it was, was not a straightforward single variable manipulation, but typically would require one to manipulate three or four sets of variables that could then bring the system back to where it was. <coughs> 